Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 25. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Well done. Okay. That was okay, wasn't it? We didn't, <laughs> that, that worked. Okay. We did it okay this time. We didn't speak over each other. Brilliant. Um, makes my life easier. So we only just met a few days ago, but we have found the time to meet again quite soon after. And there's been a lot happening and we'd like to focus on a few things in particular. One is that um, Malcolm Brown at the Church of England, he's the Church of England's Director of Faith and Public Life. And he has um, said that Christians are considered too aggressive and essentially need to be more prudent and careful and nice and uh, not be so aggressive when it comes to discussing transgender and LGBT ideology, things like that. Um, so we're going to we're going to have a little chat about that. What 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 the implications of what Malcolm Brown's saying, why he's saying it, and especially with your input, Gavin, because he speaks as an Anglican about the Church of England. And also we wanted to just speak about the Synod, the latest updates of the Synod. And they're talking about women. They're always talking about women and including all people. And um, Hollerick said, we don't talk about church teaching at Synod meetings. So we want to maybe talk about that. And the last thing, if we've got time, is that the Pope's Abu Dhabi document is said to be actively forming UN global policy. So accusations that the Pope is a globalist. Okay, over to let's Gavin then on Malcolm Brown, the the C of E director of Faith and Public Life. What is that, and what's he been saying, and why does it matter? Well, it won't be a surprise to anybody to know that the, the theme running through all the things you've chosen, Catherine, is culture, the gospel and culture, and each one of the subjects that we're looking at is going to test our understanding of culture. And I suppose if we use posh language, um, biblical hermeneutics, how we apply the Bible to the cultural issues. So if we start with the gospel for last Sunday, which was about the sheep looking at the, the people looking hassled and uncared for and unled and worried and anxious. And Jesus saying to the disciples, you're going to look after the sheep. Um, the sheep are still pretty anxious and hassled. And it's the job of the church, uh, as a number of people said in their, their sermons, their homilies, to look after the sheep but if you remember you may have heard the archbishop of canterbury talking about how he feels guilty and failing to be a very good archbishop because the church attendance has collapsed under him now it's partly his fault and partly not his fault um clearly the church is in a state of serious retreat but there are two ways you can deal with that one is to confront culture and the other one's to give into culture He's given into culture, and that's what Malcolm Brown is doing too, which is why I'm getting there by that route. So it's no good the Archbishop of Canterbury saying, oh dear, I've let the church down. It's collapsed under my leadership. It's partly my fault. Yes, it absolutely is, because he made a very serious error of judgment in giving way on the authority of the gospel and tradition in the face of a culture that is very antithetic and hostile to Christianity. How do we know it's antithetic and hostile? Because Christian teachers keep on ending up in court, uh, and not just teachers, but, but anyone who expresses the faith in the public space where it contradicts sexuality above all. So we're faced with what is effectively a new religion challenging Christian anthropology and above all challenging our ethics on sexuality and marriage. And wherever Christians say, I don't go along with this, they often find themselves in danger of losing their jobs and they keep on ending up in the courts and either Ryan Christopher with ADF or Andrea Minchella Williams with Christian Concern have to defend them. Now, what it appears happens is that some, some members of the government have gone to the to Malcolm Brown, who's the archbishop's um, go go between for policy and politics. And they said, we're getting a bit fed up with Christians defending themselves in courts. They're coming over as increasingly unreasonable. <laughs> and Brown has come back to the Archbishop and to the Church of England and said, guys, just, just it, it's not even the equivalent of letting the Christians go to the lions decently. One of the reasons that the Christian witness uh, in, the, in the Diocletian persecutions was so effective was that they refused to run away from the lions and give people their sport. Um, you might say there's a parallel here. The, the, the reason Christians are entitled to stand up in the public space and give an account for themselves and their faith. And if the people who are trying to hassle them find this objectionable, it's not the Archbishop of Canterbury or his 
civil servant go-between's job to say, shut up and let them persecute you without causing any fuss. It's such a betrayal of the gospel. And I hope, frankly, that the Archbishop feels a great deal worse about the way in which he's let the church down, because not to defend these these people who are being persecuted for their witness and their faith is an outrageous dereliction of duty, uh, and, and he, he ought to feel bad about it. Mm. Yeah, I, in danger of proving Malcolm Brown right, I'm really annoyed about this. I'm annoyed about the fact that our young people are increasingly depressed and committing suicide at higher rates than we've ever known it. It's exponential. I saw a graph today that since 1991, 49.5% of young people say they can't do anything right. Their life is not useful. They don't enjoy life. They're committing suicide. They're taking their own lives. They're seeking medical treatment that they think will solve their problems and doesn't. We have people saying they wish they hadn't taken this route. We have young people confused all over the place, don't know what's what, don't know what language to use. It's absolutely awful. It's absolutely destroying our young people. Chad Pecknold said, over the last decade, the world's been experiencing the final crack up of a fugitive political theology, which was originally and then progressively set against the church and a world in harmony with it. Depression at, at the consequence is the most rational response. Yes. Well, I teach my own children about the difference between assertiveness and aggressiveness. If it seems like we're being aggressive, that's because we've become so lily livered and soft that we think just standing up for yourself is somehow aggressive. It isn't. We we know about this idea. Can of I... Yeah. Go on. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, just to... No, you're right. I didn't want to stop you. I just wanted to say <laughs> I wanted to leap in. Well, many of us have heard that recording from a secondary school in Rye, where a ch and, and it's a Church of England school, where a Church of England driven school teacher tells the, the, the very articulate children off for complaining that they think somebody, one of their colleagues, one of their peers, who's identifying as a cat, has got a mental problem. And the teacher is bullying them, threatening them for being reported. Uh, and, and profoundly undermining any capacity for education and independent thinking with this with this grotesque act of silencing them. So this is a Church of England school in Rye. <clears throat> Finally, someone in the government is saying this is perhaps not as we think conservative education ought to be. But it goes straight back to the doorstep of the Archbishop of Canterbury in the Church of England. I'm not saying it would be entirely different in Catholic schools. I'm not making yeah. a, a tribal point. The whole of education has gone over. But it's it's a no surprise that the, 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 the statistics you just described, Catherine, are so high when you have children being bullied by an ideologically driven teacher for complaining that they think if a child identifies as a cat, it's somehow improper to say there may be something <laughs> wrong with their equilibrium. Yeah, I think I was speaking. Do forgive the noise of trains if it comes across. I'm right outside a train, a railway line, and my windows are open because it's roasting hot. So it might be noisier than usual. But um, <clears throat> I was saying saying to, to Mark, actually, uh, as a teacher, I was a teacher for 20, 20 odd years, and I absolutely find abhorrent the idea of young people recording their teachers. It's terrible. But yeah, the thing is, true. there are all sorts of things that are terrible because the order has broken down. It's completely broken down. Things are flipped. We're in clown world. We really are. Things are, things are not ordered correctly. And in that system that has been brought about by the very people now complaining, children shouldn't be recording their teachers. We've we've said to children, you are the same as adults. We want to empower you. We want you to help employ teachers. We want to give you a voice. We want to raise you up. We want to make you stand up for the environment and speak on national television and be spokespeople at 12 because we know we don't like to criticise children. So let's push the children, push the children, push the children. And then the children go and secretly record their teachers. You shouldn't be doing that. Oh, you've realised now that there's a proper authority and a proper order. Well, too late. You shouldn't have been messing around with the kids in the first place. It's an absolute disgrace. That idea of Parisia, this candid speech, this apostolic candid speech, we are called to speak truth. And if we have to be tough about it and assertive about it, it's because it's the only way to push against the, the tactics and the pressure coming the other side. So I think it's I think it's weak capitulation to say, let's be careful about how we speak. Let's not upset anyone. And I think it's because churches, uh, Catholic, Protestant, evangelical, they all suffer with the same thing because they're full of humans, which is sin. There's paedophiles, there's sexual scandals. So we better not say anything about morality. 
okay, you're sinners. You smoke fags. You drink too much booze. You you have sex when you shouldn't and with people you shouldn't. It's absolutely disgraceful. But for goodness sake, can you at least speak up for what's right, even if you can't live it? Mark. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think there's a, there's a couple of, I think you're absolutely right. The problem is that the church doesn't teach what it teaches it doesn't and that's the same obviously in the the church of england they've just capitulated to it i think it's interesting that you've got like suella suella braverman and it appears rishi sunak sort of speaking out against the transgender issue but you've got this awful gillian keegan who's the education secretary who seems to you know you can't even say that a woman is a woman or whatever and so that's uh, you know undermining the whole project as usual mm. um i think well, like, I think, remember my childhood, we were, God forgive me, and Catherine forgive me, we were terrible at teasing the teachers. It was a great pastime at school. Um, and I think, like, looking back on it, if you had the opportunity to go into school and to, that you had a, a way at all to manipulate the teachers to get them to call you a cat or a monkey or a woman or whatever, you'd be doing that every day. That'd be fantastic. You know, you could torture the teachers with it. So I think that's probably an element to it. And the other element that I think um, is that it's a bit of a fad. It's a bit of a the way that we had, you know, uh, punk rock or casuals or, uh, you know, whatever. You had to dress a certain way. Some kids, you know, to be rebellious or whatever, they listened to a certain kind of music and dressed up as goths or whatever. And today the fad, you know, and part of that probably is because we've, we've, we've empowered mm -hmm. Um, the idea of privilege, you know, that you if you're black, then you get a certain privilege. If you're LGBT, you get a certain privilege or whatever. And, you know, if you're if you're nothing, if you're cis, then you're just boring. So I'm going to be trans or I'm going to be bi. And then um, you can, you know, I've got rights all of a sudden. I've got extra special rights and you have to treat me in a special way. I mean, all of it is just, we're not teaching our kids to think critically in school. And instead, we're just, you know, bombarding them with all this absolute nonsense. And I'm not surprised that if they have it in school, then the kids go along with it, you know. And there's no one speaking against the culture. It's facile, exactly, yeah. yeah. That's our way of attention that that that, that that idea sorry sorry Gavin that that um that idea of rebellion and you say there was I remember being in the 80s and 90s and I was dressing like a goth and I was wearing fishnet tights and I was black makeup and stroppy with my parents and oh by the way so were all my friends so you think you're rebelling and all you're doing is 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 following another with pattern, a different pattern yeah. but it's still a pattern you haven't broken out of a pattern you've just replaced one pattern with another and the thing about this is um, OK, maybe you shouldn't be wearing black clothes or you look stupid or you're acting ridiculous and grumpy. But when you're telling children that, that sex is not real or that or that there's something like non-binary, non-binary is not a thing. You cannot be non-binary. Is that a hate crime to say that? that you, you can't teach a child. I'm not having my child taught that there's such a thing as non-binary. It isn't. There, there, there just isn't. So we have to be able to say that. Do we say it in an aggressive way, saying let's go and you know, lynch mob the, those who say they're non-binary? No, of course we well, don't. Well, even surely if you say not. that you are binary or non-binary, then that's binary, isn't it? Well, what I don't get is bisexuals. How can there be bisexuals if there's, if there's not just, if there's not just two gen two sexes? Oh, very so nice. I love it. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice argument. Very good business, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Tri Trisexuals, quadrisexuals, multisexuals, but not bisexuals if you're yeah. going to argue against being non-binary. Yeah, that's very that's good. That's bigoted. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just, <laughs> I, on, since we've got to a light note, I've been, well, I want to know what uh, that, um, where Mark is with that thing, because he looks to me like Oliver Reed on Gladiator. <laughs> <laughs> nice background. Thank What's you. What's the background? Uh, yeah. It's better than the office. I, I was in Colchester last night speaking to a group of newly ordained priests, and I just took that snap of the old Roman wall there as I was departing. So I thought there was I something Roman, Roman about it. You you look absolutely like a like a major <laughs> character in Gladiator. There, Gladiator. I'm just glad you're on our side. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but don't be too aggressive. No, um, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, Shall we move on? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so next we said. Um, well, we thought we might take another glimpse since it's been a while of of what's happening in Synod World. In the Catholic Synod, we, we've had uh, something about 
Oh, Mark, tell us all about the Synod and the latest comments and what uh, Cardinal Hollerick's been saying. Well, it's, it's the usual. We've had the dumpster fire and the... <laughs> it's just absolutely atrocious. Um, and Hollerick basically has come out and said that um, we don't get involved in Catholic teaching. I mean, if the cardinals aren't doing Catholic teaching, who is doing Catholic teaching? And the crisis, what the things that we've just discussed are a direct result of the fact that of the church not speaking clearly. And that is the hallmark of the Fran Francis Pontificate, as far as I'm concerned, is that, it, that he doesn't speak clearly. And it's a narrow minded, facile attempt at wooing people into the church by saying, don't worry, we don't stand against anything. You know, but if you don't stand or against anything, anything, you don't stand for anything. Exactly. And that's literally what they're trying to do is to uh, have this outreach of accompaniment and journeying together, which is a lie. They're just lying to people um, to try and get them on side. And it, how, how on earth could it work? It, it can never work and has never no. worked. No. So, you know, it's just a complete waste of time. And um, they recently had a big thing in the Vatican. um like World Fraternity Day or something like that, and there was about eight people turned up. Um, right. It's just getting more and more embarrassing. And what would you expect, really, when you've got two complete criminals like Greg and Hollerick in charge of the whole process? And I think it's important to say that, you know, this is typical Peronista. It's typical of that sort of style of governance that is the hallmark of Pope Francis' Pontifica and very Argentinian, obviously, where he promotes corrupt people to high office. So they'd never get there on their own merit or for any other reason. I mean, Greg, honestly, I mean, just look him up on my blog and you can read loads of interesting stuff about him. He actually sent me a solicitor's letter a few years ago for revealing some of the stuff that he was up to, um, which was fine because I just posted it on the blog. Um, but, like, you know, you really have got very, very strange decisions for people who have failed consistently then in this position to power and they completely owe all their allegiance to Pope Francis because there's absolutely no way they would have got into those high positions without his say-so. So, so um, don't expect... I mean, it's interesting, I was talking to these guys last night, these young priests, and one of the guys said to me that they thought that um, synodality would continue in one form or another. And I was astounded because, it, you know, we like we were talking about it earlier and everyone that you speak to says, what is synodality? What is it? Yeah. No one knows. It's just one of those words that they are using to mean whatever they want it to mean. And so what does it mean? It means in this instance, now they're talking about that the, the, the synod document is going to contain women deacons, again, which has been investigated. It's been dealt with. It's been put to bed on so many occasions. And all the progressives can do is just push these ideas time and time and time again. And it's the same old tired ideas. But, they're, you know, they're talking about polyamory. They're even talking about, about yeah. In this. polygamy. Yeah, apparently so. Um, but not but not about well, church solid. teaching. That's no, what's no, taboo. They, they don't they don't want to talk about church teaching. No, it's, it's exclusionary and <laughs> lacking in compassion. Why? Why do you? Um, why is there a push for women to, quote, access positions of responsibility and governance in the church? Why is it? Why is there such a big push? Which you, we were talking, weren't we, Mark, about uh, under uh, Pope Saint John Paul II, who who um, allowed girl altar servers. I did. I did serve in the in the in the early eighties, one of the first in, in our diocese, um, really as a way to kind of close the pressure. And the argument to try and ordain women but we then spoke about the slippery slope the slippery slopes come up in almost everything we've discussed this week from the abortion stuff we spoke about in 23 and and the stem cell research because it's it's just that crack in the door that then opens and and this is what's happened now there's more well okay we've got altar servers girls can serve at the altar that's good but now what about deacons but not priesthood just deacons and then we'll be happy but it's not it doesn't work like that, does it? Because there's always this pressure. But uh, what I don't understand, and I'm the only no, woman here, that's how, that's how. is why, why this, what, what's, why, why do women want to be priests? What do they feel they're not getting in the church at the moment that they want? 
Well, it's worked so well for sort. Anglicanism, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Gabby. <laughs> and what you describe, what you described, is exactly the strategy they use for Anglicanism. But you're asking a theological question, uh, and you're asking about spiritual discernment, and I think we should answer it in those terms. So in, in terms of what God, with the way God has made men and women, he's made us remarkably different, but in a complementary way. And mm. the gloriousness of the Catholic tradition is that where you find holy women, they become very much more women than, 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 than anybody else. Holiness seems to make people more masculine or more feminine. Mm. So then if you're going to be dealing with an anti-holy spirit, what would you expect the result to be? The answer is people will be less masculine and less feminine. And so the whole feminist movement is an attempt to defeminize women and make them more masculine. But that's not on the back of trying to amplify masculinity. What that's attempting to do is to make a kind of anti-divine, anti-spiritual androgynousness. And so, but the first step of it is to get women to step into male roles. When they've stepped into male roles, you then find they're masculinized. And then you see what, what the next step is going to be androgynousness, getting rid of either masculine or feminine, which is what the whole identifying as a cat is about. It's the next step where you, sh where you shake off uh, what's called binary gender positions or binary set in order to get rid of the God-givenness of masculinity and femininity. So that this, this, this dreadful move by synodality in order to push women first into deacons and then it'll be to priesthood and then it'll be episcopacy. And if you want to see what happens, look at the Anglicans. They've done, they've done it all. And in the end, you end up with an anti-holy, anti-holy spirit, androgynousness, where you repudiate the gift, the covenantal gift of sexuality. What we want to do is to go back to try and reinvigorate the church so that women can become more feminine and men can become more masculine because that's what the Holy Spirit does when he gets his hands on us and we don't repudiate what God has made us. It cracks me up as well. I mean, like It's just it's an old thing to say, but this idea that women aren't involved in the governance of the church. But the women run the church. They run my church, certainly. And the men are nowhere to be seen. That's kind of part of the problem, is that we can't get men engaged in the faith anymore. Yeah. One of the model, an interesting model, I think, is... Um, the Baptist church that I'm, I'm sort of engaged with, where they've got a one, you know, they've got much less people than we have in our Catholic church, but they've got a much broader model of governance where they've got, you know, a group of elders or whatever who are involved. And it's not all on the parish priest, not all on one person to make all those decisions. Mm. I've got no, you know, I think that's a great thing. I've got no problem with everyone being involved because we are a community and as much as it takes my wife and myself to run my house the same way I would expect that to be in any situation um ordination is something completely different yeah and I think it's just being looked at something about power, power. and that's a complete you know misunderstanding of the sacramental theology yeah what's extraordinary in Anglicanism is that the arguments they sold it to us they, they said you need women as clergy because they'll bring all these wonderful feminine, soft, pastoral, intuitive, empathetic gifts. Turns out that in all, almost 90 percent of the really serious bullying cases, it's women, women drunk on power who went in. And, and, and if you criticized a male priest, uh, you'd have some opportunity for him to say, look, I'm sorry, maybe the way I've been exercising my ministry and my priesthood hasn't been of the best. I've made a few mistakes. All the indication is if you criticize a woman priest, she complains that you're undermining her existential uh, authenticity and it's an act of misogyny uh, and it must not be done. She's beyond criticism in that sense. So you can renew a church, whether a male priest, you can't renew a church, whether a women priest is taken as being too profound an existential assault on the woman itself. There is no sense of humility or accountability for ministry in that sense. It's one of the problems with feminism. And the fact is that you're uncovering the whole dynamic which was all about grabbing power and so you're attacking the power base of the women in the ministry if you criticize them and they won't have it it's a terrifying thing and i don't think it will i don't think for a second i think it's important that we say i don't think for a second yeah. that we're going to see women priests in the catholic church but i think that it's this idea that everything can be talked about and everything that's what's going on and yeah. i would say there's definitely a push to approve women deacons perhaps and that you know, is part of this sort of slippery slope thing. Yeah. But it's frustrating because the, the whole thing has been looked into, even under this pontificate, it's been investigated and it's been dealt with and closed. And yet they're still doing it. And it's just that uh, progressive tool that you see 
it all, all over society, don't you? You know, them keep pushing at the closed door, you know. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I mean, I think that's that's worth saying. And we've said it before. We're going over old ground in a sense. Sorry, watchers and listeners. But um, uh, it won't happen. Of course, there, there will never be women priests in the Catholic Church. Um, I doubt there'll ever be women deacons in the Catholic Church either. But there definitely won't be women priests. Um, uh, uh, but, um, but also it brings us to what we might do about the mess that is the the very nature of having the discussion because even the nature of having the discussion um doesn't help as gavin said that beautiful line holiness makes people more masculine and more feminine it, it makes them more as god intended them to be and as long as there's this conversation going on it's it's i think it's sort of holding people back from understanding the beauty of themselves at qua woman as as bishop baron might say as woman and all that it means to be woman and man as all that it means to be and as you said perfectly rightly mark it's not about saying you can't have your uh, a woman typing up your local um uh, uh, uh newsletter or helping in the church or even at higher decision making levels but just not in this role it's just a no <laughs> for reasons. So if you need a brief, to if you need yeah. a, because we have. If you need a brief aphorism for what we're talking about, it could even be the, the 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 name for this episode. We want sanctity, not equality. If you want to renew the church, you want sanctity, not equality. Everything that the Hollerich and has, that, that we've been presented has all been about accompaniment, equality, yeah. relativism, and the whole politicization and socialization of the church. What is the opposite of that? It's sanctity. What does sanctity do? It makes men more men and women more women. Yeah. And so yeah. what the laity should be saying to the to the hierarchy is saying, absolutely no to equality. Get on your knees, say your prayers, repent. We need more of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will make us more different from each other in that in that sense. Sanctity, not equality. <laughs> yeah, or even I was well, very impassioned. Not not even we want sanctity, not equality, but with sanctity comes true equality, as in it the, the true equal value. Uh, but not sameness. But yes, exactly, exactly right. And and the other thing we which we noticed very much in America, and we maybe is something we brought back from when we went to Chicago this year, was it, we can talk about it, and that's what we're doing now. And there's lots of conversations uh, about the synod going on all around the world. Um, in fact, I'm I'm not sure there are, but anyway, um, what we can do is ask our religious brothers and sisters to pray. You know, to actually we that's what they're there for, both ourselves and others. We should ask intentionally for prayers and say, you know, this is something that that's very confusing in the culture. Go to our religious brothers and sisters, however many are left, and say, could you? In, in weekly prayer, remember this intention, you know, pray for, for for clarity on this and that. And that, in fact, we go to our nuns. That's that's a very feminine thing that women are hugely, if you want to use this, the, the term empowered, I don't like the term. Um, this is huge, this space that, you know, to, to, to go to women and say, this is the feminine, We're to, to, to open up that space and to, um, and to, uh, was it someone said the best answer they heard to why there are so many me more men in prison than women is because there are so many more women in the church than men. So, yes. So let's go to our women, our religious sisters and say, pray for greater clarity um, and maybe more vocations to the religious life, but not the demand for priesthood. I'm sure that's true. And you're quite rightly saying, don't forget that equality is important because equality in the sense that you meant it is equal yeah. worth in the face of god but we but i think we need to get rid of equality as much as we can equality is about numbers it only ever works with numbers it doesn't work with any value that i can think of apart from uh, being equally made in the image of god which is a very specific kind of equality and not much help i don't think to anybody but what we want to talk about is uh, is sanctity and and what did Jesus talk about? He never talked about equality. He mm. never talked about accompaniment. He talked about faithfulness. Mm. We want sanctity and fidelity. Those are the those, that's the language yeah. of the church, not equality and accompaniment. So I, I don't. I think the sooner we try and the more we use the language of the enemy, the more we lose these compromised words, which are designed to slip us into a whole series of false presuppositions. The more we give our uh, opponents the opportunity to distort the church i just think we shouldn't be having with it let's fight, let's go back to the language of the church equality sorry sanctity and fidelity yeah what is it mother Teresa said god has not called us to be successful but faithful 
yeah something like that good old mother Teresa. brilliant I yes right. my my daughter's been burning bits of plastic on my desk um which is that a masculine thing to do should i be seeing if she needs to look at wearing trousers and blue tops and transitioning because she's immediately <laughs> immediately she could she, yeah. yeah um i think she's trying to do something artistic but it doesn't look very artistic <laughs> create plastic bubbles anyway that's my daughter um where were we going pope pope the pope pope francis has said uh in an abu, abu dhabi document um Tell us about this, Mark. You brought it to our attention that this document is forming UN global policy. Yeah, so this was the the Abu the Abu Dhabi document that he signed, um, where he he basically got together with a uh, an imam and signed this um, this thing about you know that there was no distinction in in religion basically. Um, and I think what sort of interested me about it was the fact that there was um, we've got two world views, very much two world views at, that are at odds with each other at the moment. And it's not just I mean, this is it, it very much seems that Pope Francis has got this globalist perspective where he's saying that we're all a human family. Um, but is that a, like. Where does that where does that actually lead us? And it's the same sort of argument that we have with immigration, which I struggle with a lot. I struggle with the idea because I believe in welcoming the stranger and you know being nice to people, and I don't believe in shutting people out because we're greedy or better off or anything like that. But I do believe that we have we should be proud of our civilization, that our culture, the culture that we've built. Um, the rules that we live by, the agreed rules that we live by are important. And I, I think that we, in order to preserve that, we have to be careful about, um, you know, just allowing other people to come in and to bring their ideology into our communities. Otherwise, our community loses its, loses that. When, and when I talk about the distinctness, um, what I'm talking about is the idea of human dignity and freedom that perhaps is lacking when you look at, Shia Islam, say, for example, you know, I can't see that there's an awful lot of compatibility um, between Christianity and the, the, the Christian culture in the UK and some of these more radical ideologies from the Middle East. And so I, I thought it would be an interesting discussion on the back of this. Like, what is Pope Francis's game here? You know, um, you know, what what is this globalist thing that he keeps going on about? Um, and it, it, there's a there's a theory that he's been put in place, um, you know, that he was that cardinals were contacted uh, because Pope Benedict was a problem. He was a problem because he was preaching the gospel. And that was not what the globalist agenda wanted. And so, you know, they sort of managed to sort of get people to get behind, coalesce behind Pope, uh, you know, Bergoglio and get him elected as Pope. And now you you do see all these extremely radical globalist directions that he's, he's going in. And it's extremely worrying. Well, my response is to pray for pray for a faithful new pope. Um, I, 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 I'd pray for the conversion, uh, the full conversion of, of all senior clergy. And especially the Pope, but I'm more helpful now just to be saying, get on my knees and say, Lord, give us a new faithful Pope. Give us another JP2. Um, give us somebody who will who will be faithful to the revelation of the church. And that involves a way of dealing with Islam, which is complicated, because the problem with the Abu Dhabi statement was that it accepted the notion that a relativistic God actively will different religions this isn't anything to do with jesus and there's nowhere to be found in the gospels or in the old or new testament but actually the but nonetheless there are going to be times when we're going to need to make allies of islam because uh, at the moment it's only islam that's standing up to the fundamentalist progressive religion of gay rights it's only islam that's standing up to government policies of teaching the of sexualizing the children for puberty the christians aren't doing it and so you might say that in one sense because god chooses who he chooses that if they're willing to be faithful to the way god wants human beings to behave 
God will preference Islam over the church. That's a very profoundly shocking thing to have to say. But in, the, in that sense, we may need to make allegiances, respectful allegiances with Islam uh, in order to manage the context where we're being uh, where we're being I, I'm just rather surprised by Catherine's smile taken aback by it. <laughs> where we're being Sorry. finding ourselves in a very serious struggle with um, uh, with secular antagonism. It's a difficult path to walk, walk isn't it? And, and Pope Francis is definitely not walk, walking it um, with this guy, the Imam of Al Azhar Al Sharif. Ahmed Al Tayyib, who is, you know, he is a very, very uh, watered down version of Islam, isn't he? He's much more on the sort of Sufi, Sunni, you know, very gentle. Um, he's, I think it's in, uh, uh, well, it's obviously it is in the United Arab Emirates, um, which are the most welcoming. Uh, sort of generous version of Islam that we sort of interact with in the West. It's not, um, you know, that's, it's not the, it's not a real sort of perspective of what Islam is. So, and, uh, you know, I agree with you that, that there are, that there are things that we agree with and that's great, but we need to have clear dialogue, don't we? In, in any of the things that we talk about. And what strikes me about this is that it's not clear dialogue. It's anything but clear dialogue. It's just pretending to agree about everything for the sake of being nice, which is Can sort of like a... the, the world's problem at the moment. It, it is. I agree with that. Can we make a distinction too between Islam and Muslims? I think there are very many Muslims who are very hungry for God and have a, an absolutely genuine desire. Uh, and uh, they are to be complimented and, and paid for and loved and supported. And what's most exciting is the number of Muslims who find themselves having dreams of Jesus. Jesus is trying to get through to Muslims who are hungry for God and for whom Muhammad is not enough. And Muhammad should not be enough because he doesn't introduce people to God the Father and he does not introduce people to forgiveness and grace. <laughs> And so I think we must we must be heard to be saying that we're very much on the side of, of Muslims who are our fellow travellers as pilgrims, who are hungry for God and heading. And, and to say that we are no better behaved, we should be, but we're probably not, uh, and make no, no ethical claims of superiority ourselves. What we are making claims for is the superiority of Jesus over Muhammad, or the superiority of the New Covenant, New Testament, over the Quran. And that's something that we, we can mm. justify and defend and articulate. And it's very different from presenting ourselves as better or superior, which we ourselves are not. Well, I think that's beautifully said, but very interesting because it's the opposite of what Islam do. Islam yeah. look at us um, as inferior. And that is based on the pornography and the blasphemy and the, you know, the lawlessness that they see pervasive in our society. And that's the way that they justify things like uh, the way that, you know, um, was it the Rochdale abuse of those girls, you know, that they, they see us as less than human. I think the Quran says monkeys and pigs or something like that. So just, well, and all I'm saying is we need to be aware of the ideology and, you know, what it what it says. And, and like you say, people are people, and I've got loads of Muslim friends. I, but like That's what sort of got me interested in Islam in the first place. Um, when I was training martial arts, there were loads of guys um, who were in the club who were, um, you know, Muslims. And that, so that really sort of got me interested in it and learning more about it. And I did we're, we're, learn about we're, it. <laughs> and it terrified me. What we're, back to, we're back to Gladiator and Oliver Reed and mar yeah. through martial arts and Sorry, the walls yeah. of Colchester. <laughs> God wills it. Yeah, I... <laughs> I um I think that there's just it's difficult, isn't it? I agree with you. My instinct, Mark, is to is to say, well, you know, our fellow human beings, our brothers and sisters, no, you know, no barriers between us. But I think first of all, that's naive, and um, and also it doesn't recognise that the nation is a sort of natural state, like the family, and that there's you can welcome somebody if we take it to the to the microcosm the level of the family and you say if you welcome somebody into your home if i were to welcome you into my home there's a certain way that the bennets live and you would you would accommodate and assimilate to some extent and and then gavin would as well and then you might bring your children and they would and then suddenly we'd have i'd 
you know, maybe you'd invite all your friends and suddenly it's very difficult to manage what our family is anymore because it's it's changed. You've hung pictures on the wall and you've and you've 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 changed the furniture and you've said, I want to do this at lunch. And I know that you normally say grace before meals, but we we actually don't do that. And suddenly my children are confused. And um, and I don't think it's I don't think it's unreasonable to say that looking at on a on a larger scale that 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 Britain is you know it 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 follows it has a certain culture born out of a nation that is rooted in in our judeo christian history and that of course we want to welcome people and of course we want to say especially those who are suffering and facing torture and being rejected and being abandoned um we want to reach out to those people and help them and and absolutely should but that's a different question to just unfettered access to, you know, free borders, no borders, free freedom of movement wherever you want um, at all times. And there's no, nothing distinguishes one nation from another. Nothing distinguishes one home from another. You'd just be the same at the Lamberts as you would be at the Bennetts and the Ashendons. And there is no family and there is no nation. And that doesn't seem to me particularly Christian or particularly natural or especially nice, especially when you have a duty of care to your own family to your own children my duty to my children is it is my duty yours is to your children mark and and gavin yours is to yours um i care about your your children i love your children as a christian does but but first and foremost i'm raising my children i'm choosing what school to send my children to i'm choosing how to pray with them and how to teach them with my husband and you're doing the same with your children <laughs> no yeah no it's, I'd, it's, I'd like to get a matthew 25 well, Matthew uh, 25, the second. Go on, crack on. Yeah. You go. Well, okay, very, very quickly. Matthew 25, the second half, the sheep and the goats passage, where Jesus says, uh, there's going to be a final day of judgment, and I'm going to welcome into the kingdom those who. And then he says, <clears throat> those who fed, clothed the naked, fed, fed the hungry, that long list of things. And people take this as a universalistic uh, approbation of being nice, but it isn't. Um, the only people Jesus called his brethren are those who followed in the way. The brothers of Jesus are those who do the will of the Father. This is about Christians who are suffering. And so, Catherine, when you say my first, my first responsibility is my family, that also applies to the Christian family. And if we go back to the people Malcolm Brown is criticizing for being over aggressive in court, the people we should be supporting and looking after and treating as our first priority are the persecuted Christians in court. They are our family. They are the brothers of Jesus. That's how we <clears throat> defend and come intimate with Jesus, by looking after them. It isn't the um, declaration of how to be nice to, to the whole of the rest of the world. It's a statement about what your priorities of love and care are. They begin with your Christian family, your biological family, who ideally are your Christian family, <clears throat> and particularly the Christian family of their persecutors. We don't have to go very far in this country to look after the Christians who are being persecuted. They're right on our doorstep. They're in the news every day of the week. Mm -hmm. Jesus wants us to put them first. And also the, the very fact of Jesus saying that is the root and the rock of our Judeo-Christian culture. It, Jesus says, you know, whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you do to me, that's Christian. That wasn't Roman. That wasn't pre-Christian. They didn't say, oh, you, you, whatever, you know, slaves are like, women are like. This has come, been born out of the the Judeo the, and then Christian heritage. So to say we want such a globalist world that that no longer is the ethical norm or that anything goes or there is no right or wrong is goes against the very teaching of the sheep and the goats anyway, which says this the is the norm. These, at the least of these, my brothers and sisters, they're Christians. That's the church. Those are our neighbours. That's the priority. But it's, but it's been taken out of context and used as if we're back to what Mark was lamenting about earlier on, the family of humanity uh, on the skin of the earth. That's not the language of the Gospels. That's not the language of Jesus. The uh, brother, least of, the, of these, my brothers and sisters, are the church, Christians who are hungry, persecuted, homeless, because of their fidelity for Christ, which he promised is what would happen if you followed him. We're mm. to look after them and make them our priority. Mm. And if you look at someone and don't see the face of Christ in them, you, then you should. You ain't no Christian, bruv. Which is, what, which is what Mark's been saying about the Baptists he's been discovering, quite rightly. Yeah. Yeah. Mark. Well, I, you know, I, I, it's, that, it's that idea. I just don't really know 
what the Pope is on about. He's on about, <laughs> <laughs> as usual, as usual. He's on about, like, he didn't mention God in his speech to the United Nations Security Council. Um, and he said, he kept going on about fraternity. He said, fraternity is a decisive word which cannot remain abstract, an abstract idea, but must become a real point of departure. I suppose, and it's all, it's all just pie in the sky. You know, he went on about the war and the, what, but we're in, we're in the middle of a war in Europe. So I, I don't see how that practically is realistic. In order to deal with these problems, we have to sure we have to surely analyse what's going on and come down on one side. You know, we have to come down on the side of right and the role of the church, the role of the Pope is to say what is right, isn't it? It's to help the people to understand what Christian teaching is. And he just never seems to do that. It's just all this waffle all the time about fraternity and, you know, blah, blah, blah. What what does that even mean on a, on a world, on a global basis? You know, yeah, it's a lovely idea. You know, let's all sit in a circle and with our tambourines and smoke the pipe of peace, but it's, just seems so far away from anything that's achievable. I'd, it just hasn't got any relevance, has it? No. And that's all I've got to say about that. I think we should. I think we should bring tambourines to the next session and and intro and exit with them. Sounds good to me. I think we'll have to leave it there because it's uh, time for school pickup for me. Jolly good. You've got good to see you both, well, haven't you, Mark? Is Gavin still there? Yeah. Has he nodded off? Yes, I've listened. I've listened. Really <laughs> he nodded oh, right. off. <laughs> Good. Oh, lovely. Right. Okay. Thank you for watching. See you for uh, 26 coming up shortly. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. God bless you and keep you. <laughs>